This program is brought to you by Emory University. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I have the distinct honor of introducing our guest speaker today, Dr. Daniel Judge. Dr. Judge is a professor of medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina. He, um, he has uh, spent most of his career at Johns Hopkins and just got to MUSA about two years ago, where at Johns Hopkins he uh, established the Center for Inheritable um, Cardiomyopathies, and he's done a lot of work in um, understanding the genetic background of some of these uh, genetic cardiomyopathies, including ARVD. Um, he's a prominent figure in ARVD and cardiac amyloidosis, and I'm really excited to hear his talk today. Thanks. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for having me here today. Um, I'm going to focus on a few different things. I, when I was asked to talk about uh, whatever I wanted to, cardiovascular genetics is usually my, my main theme, although I know Ray Hershberger was here recently, so I will take for granted that he's talked a lot about familial dilated cardiomyopathy. I won't do a lot of baseline uh, sort of talk that he would do, and I'll jump ahead to some of the translational applications. Of course, we all want CME credit for this, so this slide is here for strictly that purpose, um, and we'll talk about genetics. We'll, we'll focus more on objective number three about um, translation and how clinical genetics discoveries can lead to novel therapies. Uh, there'll be some discussion of unapproved medications that are in clinical trials. As Kunal mentioned, uh, <clears throat> I spent 24 years at Johns Hopkins, seven in training and 17 on the faculty, and I really had the great privilege of getting to know Dr. Victor McCusick. And Victor was a cardiologist who I remember asking him to speak about how he got into genetics and how his field really sort of evolved around this. He, he was an identical twin, uh, and he became fascinated by by human genetic variation and set out to catalog it all. Uh, however, he was prior to that a, a well-known cardiologist. So this was the 1950s, and he was a rising star in the field of phonocardiography, pre-echo. Uh, and he said at one point he, he thought he was committing professional suicide because he had this established reputation. And he was shifting over to focus, for the most part, on rare, unimportant conditions. Well, I think that sort of worked for him, and uh, I hope that we're, we're able to do that today from some of the rare diseases that we see in clinical practice, or sometimes recognize and sometimes don't. Um, it's now 19, or almost 19 years ago, that there was the announcement of this complete sequencing of the human genome. It was an enormous project, very controversial. Should the money be spent? Was it well used? Uh, and when I asked the question, has that changed how you practice medicine or cardiology? Most people say, no, not really. You know, or maybe someone showed up last week with their 23andMe report and said, am I going to get hemochromatosis? Or, or you know, how does that impact clinical practice? It's, it's something that uh, has disappointed patients and, and the press when they write things like, genetic map yields few new cures, or research is failing the world's population. It's, it's a little distressing, but I think we're, we're able to, to step forward a little more slowly than people had predicted. And I'll try to highlight some of that over the next uh, few slides. I'm often asked about genetic testing in, in clinical practice and why do it. I'm a cardiologist. I know dilated or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy when I see it. We have an echocardiogram. What more do you need? Uh, and there's a handful of reasons, at least, that I, I run through with the patient. It's not a curiosity that we're doing. And, and certainly, when we're doing a clinical test, it's not a research or it shouldn't be a research study. Uh, it's sometimes confirmation of a clinical diagnosis or, more often, can we figure out, are there other manifestations that will affect the rest of the body besides the heart? When I ask patients about this, their usual reason for wanting to know a genetic basis for a condition that runs in their family is, who else in the family is going to get this? Who may be the next person that presents with sudden cardiac arrest? And occasionally, it's for family planning. What, what about the risk for my children? Or will I have children, and will they have this disease? Switching gears, it's sometimes done as a research test genetic evaluations and understanding populations. I won't really talk about that. That's not my area. Uh, but understanding the cause and pathogenesis of diseases and developing better therapies where I'll really try to focus things over the next few slides. So I decided to come up with four clinical scenarios. These are four patients that have seen me, and I think each of them illustrates one of these concepts of how we've, how we've moved things along from the genetics to clinical practice or, or novel therapies. The first is a 68-year-old woman who came in with shortness of breath. Uh, she 
had muscular weakness that was uh, recognized in her 30s. She was still walking. She wasn't in a wheelchair, and it wasn't a severe form of muscular dystrophy. It was a very thorough workup that took place earlier on. She had a muscle biopsy that was non-diagnostic. Uh, she developed atrial fibrillation and had a normal echocardiogram in her 50s. Now has mild cardiomyopathy, heart block, and a pacemaker. She either has sinus arrest or AFib here with a junctional rhythm in the high 40s. Uh, her pacer is set very slow to avoid RV pacing and worsening of her cardiac function. Here's her family history. Uh, she has two sisters who have not had cardiovac cardiovascular evaluations. Her youngest sister is deaf. She has two daughters who are very well. Her father died suddenly. Uh, with sudden cardiac arrest and a prior pacemaker. And her grandmother, her father's mother, died in her 50s with a pacemaker and sudden cardiac arrest. So we did genetic testing, and, and it's the bane of genetic testing if you see these variants of uncertain significance that come back. And that's often the result these days when we send off a genetic test, and it's unsatisfying. If you send someone for a stress test and they say, we don't know, you know, you might, <laughs> you might be used to that. Some of our nuclear medicine people will say that. but. Uh, Often enough, the genetic test report by default will say, well, there's not quite enough evidence to support a, a pathogenic classification. Let's focus on this variant in laminase, and I, I bet Ray talked a little bit about this. Uh, the laminase gene uh, is, is an important one for cardiomyopathy, and this one fits with the phenotype that runs in this patient's family. But we did further cardiovascular evaluations in the family. Here's our proband. She's got the mutation. Uh, her two sisters had echocardiograms. One is completely normal, an ECG completely normal, and the other with deafness actually has an EF of 40%. She had atrial fibrillation and a left bundle that no one had recognized. And her two daughters, who were healthy and worried at 42 and 36, had abnormal ECGs with normal echoes, one with just a pretty generous PR interval at 256, and the other with AFib and lots of PVCs. Uh, when we did genetic testing, we certainly showed that this variant co-segregates in the family, supporting that it's pathogenic. Well, lamins are important, as I mentioned. The, lamina, the LMNA gene encodes two proteins, lamin A and lamin C, uh, and variation in this gene is about 5% of dilated cardiomyopathy. It typically has conduction disease, often atrial fibrillation, and it, it, the mechanism whereby mutations throughout the gene can le lead to different phenotypes is really not very well understood at all. Matt Taylor and Lucy Mastroni at Colorado looked at the survival in their transplant cohort, looking at a group of patients with non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy without lamin mutations compared to a smaller cohort, admittedly a very small, 12 patients, and looked at survival. Transplant-free survival is on the y-axis. 45% at age 45 years were alive with transplant-free uh, at 45 years versus 89% in the non-lamin patients. And, and we certainly know this is a bad gene to have abnormal with dilated cardiomyopathy. The phenotypes that can happen are a long list. It's quite striking. I mentioned muscular dystrophy, and this patient that I presented has a variant of an autosomal dominant Emery Dreyfus muscular dystrophy or limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 1B. I saw a patient two weeks ago who came in and had all of the phenotype. I don't have his genetic test result back. But I was asking him about his family, and his daughter was with him. And she said, no, I'm totally healthy, except my endocrinologist is trying to figure out why I have lipodystrophy. So I'm a little worried about lamin in that family, too. Uh, ARVC has been reported, uh, neuropathies, and premature aging is one that I really find fascinating. I'll get to that in a minute. The variant that we found in this individual is absent in a large, now 60,000 patient cohort that we can search immediately and look to see how common is a variant in a population. Uh, there's one prior report as this being pathogenic, and, and the predictive algorithms vary, but it, it looks pretty darn functional by most assessments. Premature aging with this gene is striking. This is a young woman who came in to see me. She looks much older than her age. She's 44 years old here in this picture. Her grandfather is pictured here on the bottom, uh, and he's uh, 40, she, she's 44, he's 41 here. Uh, and they had an awful form of progeria and a, a lamin variant that we were able to show with Susan Michaelis's help was pathogenic. Um, back to the lamin uh, gene and how it may affect the heart. Howard Werman at Columbia has done a lot of work uh, in this area and has worked in mice to show that uh, when there's a lamin mutation in the mice, a homozygous knock-in missense mutation, uh, the hearts do poorly, and there's a lot of phosphorylated P38 MAP kinase. Uh, 
uh, at eight weeks and at 16 weeks. Uh, and in people with dilated cardiomyopathy compared to non-lamin patients, uh, P38 is also up. Uh, so it starts the process of thinking, well, is this bad? Is this something that we can target? Um, a small company, uh, Array, uh, developed a, a compound, 797, that they saw as a great therapy for inflammatory disease. Um, P38 MAP kinase is part of prostaglandins and inflammatory cytokines, and they said, let's, let's block that and see if that works in ankylosing spondylitis and osteoarthritis. And good news, arthritis is much better with this and they were really ready to move forward to a phase three clinical trial, but they looked at the QT prolongation and said, forget it, we can toss this drug in the trash, or we can look at a cardiac disease. So they looked at Howard Werman's work and said, well, let's, let's move forward with a phase two trial. Uh, and this was our, our phase two study. Callum McRae was the first author on this, and we, we had only 12 patients. Open label, uh, dose ranging study looking at uh, the Array 797 compound a selective oral inhibitor of P38 MAP kinase in patients with lamin-related dilated cardiomyopathy. These are the baseline and earlier screening and screen failure uh, six-minute walk test distances. Uh, and then the response uh, was fairly quick by four weeks and then by 12 weeks, the increase in six-minute walk test as the primary endpoint for this phase two trial was quite striking. So the phase three trial is currently enrolling. It's really having a lot of trouble getting uh, filled it's, we're looking for now about 100 patients uh, around the world, uh, and Lamin patients with non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy uh, are perfect for this study. Uh, mutations in this gene have a worse prognosis and more arrhythmia uh, than other uh, forms of non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, and novel treatments look promising. So we're hoping for that to, to go along smoothly. I'll switch gears and talk about another disease that I've enjoyed working in. This is a 34-year-old tennis player who presented with syncope last summer. Uh, EMS was called, fortunately, and she was resuscitated. Her heart was working well enough to tolerate a long run of VT, uh, but she had a further cardiac evaluation. Her cardiac MRI was somehow normal. Her ECG had T-wave inversion only in V1 and V2, and age 34, that's certainly abnormal, but not something you, you would be too concerned about without syncope. Her 24-hour Holter showed 5,000 or more uh, ventricular ectopics and her signal average DCG was positive in all three parameters. So she, she has borderline three minor criteria for ARVC right here, uh, and we're asking the question, well, what do we do with this patient? Well, ARVC is a, is a fascinating disease um, and, and really distinct in the fibro fatty scar that occurs. Scar happens all the time, ischemics or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy but the, the adiposity that occurs and the predominance in the right ventricle has been a, a really interesting uh, manifestation of this particular disease. Uh, the, disease. The diagnosis has evolved over the years and it's probably gonna evolve once again in the near future, uh, but there's a series of task force criteria that emphasize five categories, the structural, histological, electrophysiology, genetic abnormalities, and on the EP side, there's both depolarization and repolarization abnormalities. So, so it's an interesting disease. What do we have to treat this disease? Well, defibrillators, that's about it. We, we don't know if our standard therapies for left ventricular cardiomyopathies work for right ventricular cardiomyopathies. Beta blockers are ubiquitously used. Angiotensin antagonism makes sense, but it's the right ventricle, not the left ventricle. Uh, and what else can we do for this population? Well, here's her family history. She's there, she has no siblings. Her parents are well, extended family is well. Her very old uh, grandmothers on both sides had sudden cardiac arrest, but they didn't sound suspicious. Uh, and we did genetic testing, and she has the most common uh, splice site variant in the placophyllin 2 gene that it occurs in our large Hopkins database of ARVC patients. So this is a common variant. In fact, it occurs in unaffected patients uh, often. We know that there's environmental factors that influence the genetics to, to cause this disease. I mentioned she was a tennis player, and we know that exercise is something that really brings this disease out. Um, when uh, we combined our data with a Dutch group, um, Peter Van Tintelen and I were the genetics part of this, and Hugh Hawkins and Richard Hauer were the, the clinical EP sides of this very large cohort of 1,001 ARVC patients and family members, and looking at the genetics, PKP2 pathogenic variants are certainly the most common, and we can find a, a clear abnormality in around uh, 60, 65 percent of those patients, and then uh, we're still looking at uh, the cause for about a third of them. 
Not sure what that third will turn out to be, um, but, but PKP2 is certainly one of the most common variant, uh, genes with variation that causes this disease. Well, I mentioned before about how having the genetics hasn't really turned into the therapy, despite a lot of enthusiasm in the press and for our patients. One of my patients last night emailed me saying, with exactly this mutation, can CRISPR work for this yet? You know, when can I have CRISPR therapy for my ARVC? Uh, and we're not there yet. Thinking about the, the mechanism of disease, um, the easiest way to explain how a desmosome mutation causes right ventricular cardiomyopathy in the context of exercise is number one on this diagram is cell adhesion. If you're exercising, you're pulling heart cells apart, and the desmosome is really like the glue that holds myocytes together. So the more exercise or stretch there is, the more disease you may uh, invoke on that basis. Uh, transcriptional abnormalities I'll get to next on the next slide, and that's uh, a big focus right now. And then there's probably alterations in other so, uh, cellular junction proteins, gap junction proteins that are affected by these desmosome gene variants. Uh, A.J. Marion's group really st stumbled onto this, and, and, and a lot of groups, including my own, have followed this. Uh, canonical Wnt signaling is shown here on the left side of the slide. Uh, we know that uh, normal Wnt signaling occurs through the frizzled receptor and activates beta catenin, which goes to the nucleus and activates target genes. Uh, the desmosome is shown here intact. When the desmosome is abnormal, any abnormality, so PKP2 or desmoglein 2 or any of the genes, uh, we know it disrupts the complex. We know the complex loses its staining. So Jeff Saffitz has highlighted a lot of this, had a nice New England Journal paper and was proposing that that it would be a diagnostic test to look for placoglobin staining in the, in the heart biopsies, but that hasn't really panned out quite as well as we'd hoped. Um, when the desmosome is disrupted, Junction placoglobin is also known as gamma catenin. So beta catenin and gamma catenin sound similar for a reason. They are very similar. And gamma catenin uh, effectively competes for canonical Wnt signaling, decreasing Wnt signaling, and leading to a loss of these target genes being expressed. So one simple strategy is to activate beta catenin or canonical Wnt signaling. And a way to do that is to block its inhibitor, GSK3 beta. So this goes back to work, again, with collaboration with Jeff Saffitz, and uh, Callum McRae was really the person who drove a lot of this because he had his high-throughput chemical screen. And they identified a, a compound, a small molecule, that is a Wnt activator, uh, and showed in, uh, initially in a zebrafish model uh, that functional assessment with this GSK3 beta inhibitor or activation of Wnt signaling uh, improves the, the mice with the deletion or uh, frame shift in placoglobin, and it also restores uh, sodium current in those mice. Uh, we also, in my lab, developed a desmoglein knock-in mutation, so it took a different gene in the same complex, knocked in a, a mutation that uh, removes two exons uh, and, and leads to a clear loss of protein production. Uh, we had typical staining for uh, DSG2 in the wild types and a loss of staining in the mutant mice, not seen at all in the western blots. Their echocardiograms show the wild types up here and the mutant mice down here, a large biventricular cardiomyopathy. Histologically, there's a lot of fibrofatty scar. Uh, and then histologically, also, we see normal staining of a control um, protein, N-cadherin, but loss of connexin 43 and placoglobin staining. So this was a robust model that looked a lot like human ARVD. Uh, Fibrosis, as mentioned, is much higher in the, in the mutant mice. Perilipin is a stain for fat, and we showed in our mutant mice at 16 weeks of age that there's a lot of perilipin. Uh, and when we merge that, we're able to show uh, where it is in relation to the, the myocytes. So, so this is a, a, a model that has fibrofatty scar. Uh, uh, Stephen Chelko, who's an Emory graduate, uh, who's a PhD, who's worked in my lab, and uh, now is an independent investigator at Hopkins, and Angeliki Yasumaki, working with Jeff Saffitz, uh, really tag-teamed this project as the co-first authors. Uh, and starting with the, the treatment, over here is the vehicle and the uh, DSG2 mutant mice. Uh, the mutant mice have a loss of ejection fraction compared to the wild-type controls, and the treated mice had near normalization of their, of their cardiac function when treating with this uh, uh, SB216763, which I'll just call SB2. Histologically, there's a, a nice return to normal staining for both placoglobin and connexin 43. The fibrosis is uh, improved or re reduced uh, 
uh, treated with uh, SB2 versus vehicle. This is the vehicle, there's a lot of fibrosis. This is SB2. And the mutant mice, there's a lot of um, uh, improvement in the fibrosis. And when we look at the QRS duration as a marker of uh, electrical disease and an sort of like a signal average DCG, uh, it, it's restored, meaning this uh, dotted light blue line uh, is restored in the mutant mice compared to the red line in the vehicle-treated mutant mice. Of course, um, mice uh, like to exercise when we give them the opportunity. So we, we did exercise studies in, in swimming and asked the next question of, could SB2 improve their response to exercise? Uh, and so once again, we were able to show, uh, I was quite pleased to see the um, a little bit of an improvement in the injection fraction and a greater improvement in survival uh, in the mutant mice treated, all exercised, uh, these with um, vehicle, these with SB2, and these were the wild type mice. The, the death occurs in at least a couple of mice here and there from the, from the exercise. Uh, what about human trials? So my patients, when they hear this, say, well, when can I get this SB2 medication? It, it only takes a quick look in the literature, the oncology literature, to see how many diseases, how many cancers have been associated with canonical wind signaling. Uh, and sort of the opposite is one of the theories or strategies for treating cancer of turning off wind signaling, particularly when there's metastatic disease. And so the drug companies that have thought about and considered Wnt activators have run away screaming from anything that's going to potentially cause colon cancer or worsen malignancies. And so that's not going to turn out to be the strategy, at least that we're able to move into clinical trials for people. Uh, but we are right now dissecting this or working on other downstream mechanisms that we may be able to target without activating Wnt that are hopefully part of the process of the benefit by activating Wnt signaling. Um, I'll, I'll shift gears to a third patient uh, and talk about, this is a 70-year-old uh, attorney in rural South Carolina who was referred for an infiltrative cardiomyopathy. He had longstanding hypertension and left bundle branch block, uh, and of course had a coronary angiogram when he saw a cardiologist who, who said it was completely normal. Uh, he also had severe uh, inflammatory arthritis. Uh, it was called rheumatoid arthritis. I think it was, yeah, it was definitely seronegative, as is noted here. Uh, and he was always taking prednisone. He'd taken infliximab for a little while and was back to prednisone and uh, on variable doses at a pretty substantial dose. His echo shows LVH with a small cavity. His EF is 55% with biatrial enlargement. And here's his ECG. Uh, it's not exactly low voltage, but it's not the robust volts you'd expect with the left bundle and LVH. Um, and so it's not really a surprise of where we're going. We're, we're worried in this patient uh, thinking about cardiac amyloid. We've put together a nice uh, strategy for how to assess amyloid. And I think, uh, I understand you, you, there, there are plenty of experts in the room on amyloid, so I won't go into lots of detail about the diagnostic algorithm. But I'll, I'll say, just to start, if you have a suspicion for the disease, uh, the first fork in the road is, is this light chain disease? So serum and urine electrophoresis uh, with uh, a presence or absence of a monoclonal protein. If the answer is yes, then you need to really quickly and thoroughly look for uh, either multiple myeloma or AL amyloid uh, and identify that typically by a biopsy. In fact, we've come up with the strategy of calling an MGUS, must get under the skin. You need some tissue to biopsy to get under the skin and, and determine is that light chain disease. Well, our patient had a kappa lambda ratio of 1.0 as immunofixation and serum and urine were completely normal. So I was confident that he didn't have light chain disease. His technetium pyrophosphate scan was not the robust grade three that I was expecting. It was grade two. Um, I needed a normal TTR genetic test. So at this point, you could say, and I would say for most patients, we'd made our diagnosis. We had TTR cardiac amyloid. Um, but there was still this lingering doubt. The clinical suspicion remained here. Uh, why would that be? Well, he has awful inflammatory arthritis. An AA, or inflammatory amyloid, a disease caused by deposition of serum amyloid protein A, can occur. It very rarely affects the heart. Um, in several hundred patients that I've cared for with amyloid in this context, I've seen two people with AA amyloid on mass spectrometry in their heart. One was a guy who had actually a research study for um, scleroderma. It was done under a research protocol, and it was an incidental finding. Didn't cause heart failure, and it just uh, I'll ignore that one. Another with severe 
uh, inflammatory HLA B27 and iritis and developed awful amyloid and sure enough had AA amyloid on his mass spec. Uh, so I was worried that this guy with awful inflammatory arthritis might have AA amyloid. We did the cardiac biopsy, it was um, TTR, so we're back to where we started. It's, it, it's an easy case, but uh, it, it was worth thinking about, at least in this sense. Uh, I'm often asked about my threshold for heart biopsy. As a heart transplant cardiologist, we do biopsies all the time. In an LVH heart, it's usually a pretty benign procedure, even for someone who's older. And um, I've had patients who, who've gone through the, almost always come through the procedure and say, that was a whole lot easier than it seemed it was going to be less morbidity than a coronary angiogram. And so I, I think biopsies are, are still an important part of this process when we have questions or, or any clinical suspicion that remains. Well, back to treatment for this condition. And I think this is a space that's gotten really exciting with a lot of support because years ago, um, the answer for amyloid was, well, why look if there's no treatment? And, and why tell the patient they've got this awful disease that there's no therapy for? Uh, and now that there's treatments that are available, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for identifying patients with amyloid and getting them on the right treatments. So um, on that list, um, heart transplant is certainly our last stage, and I, I won't talk about that today. Um, the, the last resort always, uh, but still an option. Um, and I think removing amyloid plaques is something that's still in theory, and I won't, uh, I won't focus on that, but there's Companies developing antibodies that have had variable, mostly negative, <laughs> results of being able to um, remove dense protein plaques from organs that are affected. But let's start with stabilizing the mutant TTR protein. Uh, Jeff Kelly, who's a really smart uh, biochemist who has focused a lot on transthyretin, uh, made a genetic discovery. Um, and that's where things started. So he uh, was. Uh, able to publish a, a tiny report, you know, nearly 20 years ago in science. It didn't take very much to get it in. Uh, a cohort of patients uh, in Portugal who had V30M TTR familial amyloid polyneuropathy. And for some reason, there was a, a subset in those families that had absolutely no disease or, or very late onset. And when they looked closely at their transthyretin gene and protein, there was a second alteration, another missense mutation this time a threonine at position 119 to a methionine uh, on the other copy, so it was in trans, and it was shown to improve and stabilize the counter, the, the destabilizing effect of the V30M mutation. And why does this lead to stabilization when we know that V122I, just three amino acids downstream, causes worse function? It's, it's not exactly clear. It's a conformational effect, uh, but it, it clearly focused attention on that portion and how that protein with that specific change could stabilize uh, the, the, the tetramer. And this was proof, really, of stabilization of the tetramer leading to delays in prevention of amyloid disease progression. Uh, well, if, if a tetramer can be stabilized by genetic complementarity, by a transmutation that stabilizes it, that maybe pharmacologic agents can also do the same thing, that can bind to the tetramer in these ligand binding sites or where the, the uh, T119M variant occurs and stabilize the tetramer and improve outcomes. <clears throat> Matt Maurer uh, led this study, and I think Matt's almost regretting it right now based on uh, conversations with him. Uh, but this was a large uh, FDA phase three study of 441 patients who were randomized uh, to a, a, a three-arm trial, uh, two to one to two receiving either tofamidus at a high dose, 80 milligrams, 20 milligrams, uh, or placebo. And the primary endpoint was um, a really novel, somewhat novel uh, method of statistical analysis. I'm not a statistician, but I can say that the second and third authors are the statisticians who said, hey, let's look at this Harvard group uh, that put together the Finkelstein Schoenfeld method for essentially a, a win ratio, but a complicated win ratio where every hospitalization and every uh, cardiac event counts uh, and every patient is compared to each other. So in a relatively small cohort, 441, although very large for an amyloid study, they were able to come up with a, a, a positive uh, result. So the, the result, the primary endpoint was um, uh, cardiovascular hospitalizations and death uh, at 30 months. And, and had a remarkably beneficial effect with a p-value that was striking at 0006, uh, win ratio of 1.7. Uh, the, the placebo cohort had worse tolerability than the drug, so tofamidus is very well tolerated. Uh, 
There's no significant adverse events that were attributable. Uh, progression of disease was the only thing that really shows up. Uh, dose reductions were similar in both arms of both to famitis and uh, placebo, so, so really um, very good in terms of the result, much better than expected. Uh, on average, seven and a half patients would have to be treated for an additional patient not to have the study outcome of death or hospitalization. So, so it looks good in this sense. This is the uh, all-cause mortality. Um, 18 months is where the curves start to diverge, uh, but the, the benefits in six-minute walk tests are, are shown earlier, and the KCCQ, or quality of life studies, also look better. Also notice that the tefaminous arm isn't, isn't perfect. It's clearly everybody's getting worse. It's just better than placebo, so people are definitely progressing with disease on average in both uh, treated and untreated cohorts. The problem here is the, the financial toxicity. So this drug is incredibly expensive. I mentioned how Matt Maurer has, has disavowed the study practically, and it's largely based on the, the enormous cost for this medication. So it's frustrated a lot of people, including myself in the field, and hoping that this would have turned into a, a, a lower cost, but I think that's maybe naive as I think about big pharma. Um, but that helped us sort of turn our attention. Uh, my colleague Isabella Graef is a, uh, an MD at uh, Stanford who's focused a lot on transthyretin. And she, together with A, uh, uh, Dr. Almad Al Shea, I can't pronounce his name very well, developed a drug called AG, the first letters of their last name, 10. So AG10 is a, uh, a drug that they identified through a high throughput chemical screen that stabilizes the TTR tetramer at the same site uh, as the gain of function mutation that I showed you uh, a few slides ago, the genetic complementarity studies that uh, Jeff uh, Kelly had developed. Uh, and uh, because of this, uh, and because of the, the high costs of tefaminous, we were able to sort of move this study forward um, and we're able to start a phase two study uh, just about a year ago. The phase two study uh, had multiple sites, had only uh, 49 patients, and I think everybody told the company, boy, you'll enroll this study in about five minutes, and they, they did in about a week. I think the entire study filled up in several sites that were in the process of site inve investigator meetings and you know getting things started, getting things through the IRB, were shut down, we're, we're not able to participate. Uh, uh, the study was uh, focused um, on um, AG10 at two doses, 400 milligrams twice daily uh, versus 800 milligrams twice daily versus placebo. So two-thirds of patients got um, medication and one-third got placebo. And then everybody uh, was able to enroll in an open-label uh, extension study. To get into the study, you needed class two or three heart failure. It was similar to the ATTRACT study. You had to have at least one prior hospitalization for heart failure, or clinical evidence of heart failure. Uh, up to age 90, um, which is typical in these studies of TTR amyloid because it's an older age population that's affected. Because it's a phase two study, the primary endpoint is safety and tolerability. The secondary outcome measures were pharmacokinetics and the usual things along those lines. But to look at stabilization of TTR, we used a TTR serum concentration uh, as well as stabilization by the standard assays, a fluorescence pro probe exclusion and a western blot assay. So the baseline characteristics are shown here. It's an older cohort, as mentioned. The average age was 75 years old, essentially. Mostly men, uh, mostly wild-type disease, although there was reasonable representation, at least in the drug-treated cohort, of patients with uh, familial disease. Uh, it's class two and three heart failure, so more twos than threes, but the, the threes were a little higher in the treated cohort. Uh, demographics, race are shown below. Uh, NT pro BNP was high for all of these patients. It was a pretty sick cohort. Uh, troponins were, were generally positive at low levels, typical again of, of TTR amyloid and heart failure. And the TTR levels, the serum levels, were generally low across all three cohorts. The, the subtypes of familial disease are shown here, predominantly V122I. Uh, which is the gene abnormality that occurs in 3%, 3.4% of African Americans. The THR60 ALA variant, there were two with that. Uh, and that's a, another very severe disease gene uh, mutation. Uh, V30M is much less common in the US than in Portugal and Brazil. Uh, and wild type disease was the predominant uh, for this cohort. Shown here are the safety and tolerability. And really, this drug is well tolerated, much like tofaminous. Uh, in terms of adverse events, uh, any adverse event, uh, 
similar in all three cohorts, including placebo. And this is a sick population, so there were things like um, shortness of breath and, and heart failure, uh, adverse events uh, that didn't count as endpoints that were, were noted, as well as SAEs um, that are shown here. Uh, the um, Similar in terms of uh, both the placebo and treated cohorts, and none really at all in the high-dose cohort. So we were quite pleased with, with the uh, high-dose AG10. Uh, when we looked at the, the best marker that we could come up with for for stabilization, it's the serum level of TTR. We know the, the more stable your, your protein complex is, the higher your level is. Uh, and this is essentially pre-albumin. TTR and pre-albumin are the same thing. The y-axis here is the change from baseline to the day 28 uh, endpoint where we were assessing the stabilization in the end, end point of serum TTR concentration. The placebo cohort is shown over here. Those with familial disease have hatched bars. So uh, that Overall change was, was quite low. Uh, overall, one person dropped. This was probably from inflammation, because uh, inflammation does lower your TTR levels. And across both treatment groups at low dose and high dose, there was a, an increase in all patients. Everybody, by the end, achieved a normal level, uh, and there, were, uh, there was no worsening. In fact, there was maybe a trend towards patients with familial disease having a greater response. So there was clear evidence uh, of, a, of an effect. The drug was doing something and raising TTR levels. Uh, at AHA, just recently, we were able to present now open label extension data from this phase two study. So everybody now uh, who was able to participate, it was 46 patients who went on to um, the open label extension, uh, had uh, uh, their assessment at 15 months, which was a pre-study uh, specified uh, time point for, for FDA. And conveniently, we were able to uh, compare that to the placebo cohort of the ATTRACT study. That's the largest untreated cohort of ATTR cardiomyopathy patients that's available. So, so a reasonable group to compare, because the phase two study, after the, the placebo period of time, had open label extension and everyone was receiving medications. The, the placebo cohort of ATTRACT uh, at 15 months had a 15% mortality. Uh, or transplant, but it was entirely mortality, I think, in this cohort. There may have been one transplant. Uh, and in here, uh, our, our uh, AG10-treated cohort, 8.5% mortality, which now it's a cross-trial comparison. I can't say it's directly better, but it's, it's um, not worse, and I'm, I'm pleased, <laughs> pleased at that. Uh, and then cardiovascular hospitalizations uh, are also uh, <coughs> looking good compared to the, the cross-trial comparison and the placebo cohort in the ATTRACT study. Uh, what about turning off the gene silencers? Um, and this is really something that when I tell my patients, hey, we're going to turn off your TTR gene, their, their eyes look a little bit wide, like, really? Like, can you do that? Is, that? is that a good idea? And of course, there's lots of therapies coming along in this area, particularly things in the liver like PCSK9. Can you, can you target um, proteins that are produced by the liver? And these therapies tend to go directly to the liver. So any company that's making RNA inhibitors or antisense oligos, is excited about transthyretin because it's a, it's a nice disease that's readily treated. Uh, as we look at the, the two published studies um, shown on this slide and the next slide, uh, Patisseran had a very good outcome. And what I'm struck by is the, the MNIST plus seven, one of the neurologic impairment scores that they use. Uh, the y-axis is no change over the time course. Uh, the blue line is placebo, uh, or sorry, the blue line is treated group and the placebo is the gray line. Up is worse. Um, this is at nine months and at 18 months. And this is the normal progression of familial amyloid polyneuropathy. And if this drug were, were better than placebo, but everybody was getting worse, then it would be similar probably to tefamidus, at least on the cardiac side of things. But for the first time ever in a neurologic, in a neuropathy that I can think of, there's improvement in neuropathy in this score. So I'm excited about that, uh, and I'm hopeful that some of what we're seeing on the, on the neuropathy side will turn into cardiac benefits, and those trials are, are enrolling and underway. Scott Solomon led this look at uh, the cohort and the patients uh, in the Apollo study. Uh, <clears throat> 126 of the 225, so a little over half of the patients, had class one or class two heart failure. Class three was an exclusion criterion. And Scott, who, who run the, ran the ECHO core lab for this study, uh, looked at change uh, of ECHO parameters, essentially, and calculated cardiac output. 
looked at wall thickness. Of course, this is in uh, you know a millimeter, maybe a little bit better. I'm not sure we can draw conclusions from this. It's subgroup analysis, although the primary endpoint was positive. There's, there's at least a signal that this is uh, a good therapy for the heart. And years ago, I think familial amyloid polyneuropathy and familial amyloid cardiomyopathy were thought of as different diseases, but there's not really a good reason to think of them as different diseases. It's really the same thing. So I'm hopeful that something that works for the neuropathy will work as well for the cardiomyopathy. I mentioned that there's two drugs and two companies. This is inotericin, published in the same issue of the New England Journal, and both were positive in terms of their results. So both got FDA approval. Inotericin has some trouble with thrombocytopenia and renal injury, and there's a lot of monitoring that's required. Uh, and at least I'm glad that there's competition to hopefully address some of the costs, although both drugs are really expensive. The financial toxicity of trifamidus looks mild compared to the expense of both of these drugs. So to summarize, TTR amyloid, uh, it's much more common than previously recognized. Uh, early diagnosis leads to effective therapies to stabilize the tetramer or inhibit the production of the monomeric form of TTR. And financial toxicity is creating opportunities for new therapies that are under development. I'll switch gears to a, a fourth case. I mentioned uh, a pediatric patient. I'm not a pediatric cardiologist, but I was glad to get involved with this family. Uh, this is a two-month-old. She's now four years in this picture, but uh, a two-month-old child who presented with dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, myocarditis was excluded, and heart failure was worsening. Uh, she survived a cardiac arrest and was transplanted at three months of age. So really, um, this story started with us going to view biopsies with our cardiac pathologist, Mark Halushka, and Mark was waiting for slides to show up, and he said, hey, I want to show you a really cool slide. We did a transplant, and this young girl had a sister who also required a transplant, uh, and she unfortunately passed away after her transplant. But he said, hey, look at, look at what happened. Actually, I'll get to that in a minute. There was nothing in the family uh, to, to see other than the two siblings, so we were considering a recessive disorder or a um, gonadal mosaicism. But, but in looking at these two individuals, clearly familial. And Mark took out the slides and had stained for KO67 and said, can you believe how many dividing cardiomyocytes there are in this heart? So this is just a random section where, where green is KI67, a marker of proliferation, blue is the nucleus, red is uh, actinin or a muscle um, uh, protein, and weak germagglutinin outlines the cell boundaries. And, and the closer you look, the more you realize there's, there's cardiomyocyte division here. The first question is, she's three months of age. Is that normal? Is heart failure worsening that? But it turns out, even at three months of age, you don't tend to see this. Are these uh, lymphocytes or fibroblasts? And so we really did some, some close scrutiny, making sure that any nucleus with a positive KI67 signal was bounded completely by either troponin or actinin. And these were clearly dividing uh, cardiomyocytes. So here's our control cohort of patients that were transplanted at a similar age, uh, and uh, our proband here, who uh, we replicated in some others, including her sister, had marked proliferation. Well, of course, it's genetic, and we looked at initially a cohort of cardiomyopathy genes, wondering if this was a funny uh, effect in a standard gene like lamin AC or a sarcomere gene, and certainly nothing like that showed up, so we, we resorted to exome sequencing. Looking at a trio, the proband, uh, who was alive and able to give us DNA, although her sister was deceased, we had fixed tissue. We were able to get some DNA from that. And both parents were, of course, eager to participate. We filtered the results on the basis of a recessive disorder, assuming that a mutant allele was inherited from each parent. And we focused on genes um, in which a novel sequence variant uh, was present uh, on both copies, but not present in growing repositories of normal human variation, at least at first. So here's the list, and this is the kind of list that you get from exome sequencing. Actually, we were kind of lucky that the list was this short. Uh, and we were able to exclude a few as things were coming along in 1,000 genomes. And, and then uh, we're able to extract DNA from fixed tissue and focused really on this change in this gene, both two copies, each one inherited from a different parent, uh, that were duplication of eight nucleotides or a deletion of 19, so frame shifts and deletions. Uh, of the protein and, and uh, encoding a, a protein called ALMS1, or Alstrom protein. Alstrom protein is part of the primary cilium. Uh, its expression is ubiquitous. It's throughout all cells that have a primary cilium, including heart, cardiac myocytes. The function of the cilium is really unknown. There's a lot of speculation. It may do something for pressure sensation. It may do something for um, transport of different things up and down uh, the, the primary cilium. 
Alstrom syndrome is known to occur, and in fact, this was bad news for the patient because she, at uh, three months of age, showed no signs of disease, but has gone on to develop progressive blindness and deafness. Fortunately, that was something that we knew would happen, and she was able to prepare and had training uh, to, to be prepared for her loss of vision and her loss of hearing. Uh, obesity, diabetes, and multi-organ failure are really parts of this awful disease. Uh, around this time, uh, a group in Canada had published, actually, it was a few years previously, they'd published five patients, five infants with neonatal heart failure, and they called this mitogenic cardiomyopathy. Uh, they reported uh, marked positivity for KI67, just like we saw. And so I called them up and asked them, could you please send us something? Of course, there was no DNA available. But they did have paraffin blocks from four of the five and said, all right, here you go. Uh, and um, we extracted DNA. There was a very thorough um, uh, student in the lab who, who marched through this project. It was not a small gene, and we were able to analyze. And each one of these patients had a recessive uh, in one case, homozygous, in another case, compound heterozygous mutations in uh, ALMS1 leading to truncations. So it starts the process of us saying, is this gene important? This is a nice association, but is it really a cause and effect? What happens if we turn this gene off in cell culture? So we took neonatal cardiomyocytes that uh, we were able to isolate at postnatal day 0.5 and treat them with siRNA, knocking out or suppressing this ALMS1 gene. And in fact, we saw increased markers of proliferation with phosphohistone H3 in cardiomyocytes. Uh, we looked at this with the, the percentage of cells that were in S phase or a, a, an indication of cell division. And in those that received the ALMS knockdown, that was increased. Uh, shown here schematically, those in G2M were higher, uh, in S phase were higher, uh, and those in G0 were lower in those that were treated with the ALMS1 knockdown. Uh, Ken Bohaler, uh, who's over uh, at the NA, uh, NIA, the National Institute of Aging, sent us his um, uh, uh, construct for, for creating cardiomyocytes or selecting cardiomyocytes in ES cells. So we took an ES population and, and used this uh, pure myosin resistance cassette that's driven by an NCX1 uh, promoter, an early expression of a cardiac gene uh, that, that leads to loss of any non-cardiac cells. And we had greater than 98% cardiomyocytes in our, in our cell culture uh, studies after that. And uh, when we, once again, knocked down uh, KI67, uh, we're able to see, um, or so when we knocked down ALMS1, we're able to see increased KI67, phosphohistone H3, and another marker of proliferation, uh, uh, phosphoaurora kinase. We looked at EDU uptake, which was increased. We looked at S phase on uh, fax analysis. It was also increased. But none of those said it was really leading to more cells, because all of those could have been stuck and stopped there. So we got to a final stage of actually just counting cells with an automated counter and showed, in fact, an increase in the counted cells after treatment with this ALMS1 siRNA. Uh, and then, turns out, um, Jürgen Neger at Jackson Labs was studying Alstrom disease, and he had an Alstrom syndrome mouse model uh, with ALMS1 knockout. And he had no interest in the heart. The hearts were fine. And he said, sure, I'll send you some hearts. And, and so we were able to look at those. And in fact, uh, there were increased markers of proliferation. Uh, and this was at postnatal day 15, when we should not expect to see markers of proliferation. We were able to show increased uptake of EDU, uh, like BRDU, a marker of proliferation. Um, and then uh, we were able to analyze um, on the basis of their heart weight to body weight ratio. Uh, they were a little bit larger in terms of their heart to body weight ratio, although their bodies were smaller. Uh, and then the, the actual size of the cardiomyocytes was smaller. So the combination of smaller cells but a larger ratio led to the conclusion of having more cardiomyocytes. So to summarize ALMS1, factors causing the perinatal loss of cardiomyocyte proliferation were previously unknown. Why did, why did heart cells? reach a point where they just don't divide anymore. It's, it's probably because a dividing cardiomyocyte doesn't organize its sarcomeres very well. It's just not a good way of making the heart function. And in fact, with these two infants who had um, heart failure, that uh, it's not exactly clear that the excessive division caused the heart failure, but they were both there. Exome analysis identified uh, Alstrom mutations in this sibling pair, and we, we validated that in four additional individuals with the same phenotype. 
Knockdown studies confirmed increased proliferation of those increased cardiomyocytes uh, in, the, uh, in the murine cardiomyocytes. And the, the uh, deficient mouse hearts have larger heart ratios with greater cardiomyocyte density. So I'll really stop there and leave some time for questions and say that optimal management of patients with heart failure requires a precise understanding of the underlying disease. Genetic testing isn't always easy, um, but careful review of the results and additional testing with scrutiny in families looking for co-segregation can provide greater clarity for those uncertain results. And really what I think is the most exciting part about all of this is developing translational therapies that should follow after that. Lots of people to thank, which are shown here, some at MUSC and some where I maintain my adjunct appointment at Hopkins were shown here. Thank you. Yes. That was a great talk. Thanks so much. I had a couple of questions. First about the, uh, the last one, the ALMS mutation. Is there a vascular phenotype with that, given the primary cilia has been involved in vascular right. development? And yeah. Uh, no idea is my answer. And um, the, the, the cilium does so many things, and I, I'm well aware. Uh, we didn't see the heart failure being something that was ischemic, for instance. It, uh, it wasn't a severe phenotype. We haven't looked uh, in patients or in, and, and we actually certainly could look in our patient now. She's uh, on calcineurin inhibitors. and. MMF and other things that might have effects. She's got hypertension as, as usual for Alstrom disease, but I bet there's a way in the mouse to, to look more closely. We, we just haven't looked. And the second question was going back to your first uh, bit of your presentation about the P38 uh, MAF kinase inhibitors. Um, you know, you detailed very carefully and about the Wnt pathway and how there's sort of a double-edged sword there. Yeah. What are your thoughts about the P38? I mean, it's so ubiquitous and and stress signaling and self liberation yeah. itself. What about off-target effects there? And <clears throat> yeah. That? Yeah. It's uh, in the phase two study. There, there certainly is more toxicity. Uh, and and I mentioned in the um, the the phase two study for the inflammatory arthritis and other groups are looking at the same target for both heart failure uh, and um, inflammatory diseases. But, but you're right, the fact that we're talking about a drug that works on inflammatory disease and heart failure and has a lot of effects, there's definitely going to be some off-target problems. Uh, we've, in the phase two study, seen uh, oral ulcers, for instance, are, are a common known side effect that is incapacitating in some cases. And, and I think it's, it's too soon to know if this is going to be an effective therapy. And I think the reason the company is focused on lamin uh, is, first, it's a rare disease, so it's an easier pathway to get approval, but also a group that does really badly. So it's the plus minus the cost benefit of if someone, if they really have bad heart failure, maybe the, the risks are acceptable. Whereas if it's just osteoarthritis, well, there's some NSAIDs and other things you can take. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, hemochromatosis. Uh, I wasn't aware of any cardiac effects. Have you found any? Um, so he hemochromatosis is certainly on our differential for patients with a dilated cardiomyopathy. And um, one of the things that's striking, I, I mentioned it in passing in that because it happens regularly as someone has done their 23andMe Christmas present or something and comes back with a result that says, I have this predisposition to hemochromatosis. What does that mean? Um, and, and what's striking is the penetrance is so low. Uh, it's a recessive disorder, so if both copies of the gene carry the most common mutation, pathogenic mutation, the uh, C282Y uh, mutation, it's functional, um, but there's usually other factors that lead, I think, to the cardiomyopathy occurring. Um, and you know, women are protected in terms of iron deficiency. Uh, if there's a lot of iron use, uh, it's increased absorption, and the toxicity is certainly there. Um, but it's, it's a rare finding in our patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. In the back. Sorry about that. You mentioned Perfect. the concerns of uh, inotisserin and specifically thrombocytopenia. Uh, from what I understand, there have been some deaths in yes. subarachnoid hemorrhage. So in, in what context would you use uh, inotisserin or propotisserin for FAP? Yeah, that's a great question, and I, I try to um, try to have an even hand when I'm talking about therapies because there's so many therapies out there, and I've fortunately not been accepting um, payments or advice or guidance to either 
a company making silencers, and I've purposefully maintained um, a sense of not wanting conflicts of interest for those two companies because I think they're developing, both developing good therapies, uh, and I don't know which one's going to be better. I think right now, I have not prescribed anatercin somewhat because of the thrombocytopenia, but more because of the renal injury, uh, which is such a hassle for patients with heart failure. I didn't even mention diflunosol, which is another effective therapy that John Burke at BU has sort of led that strategy, and that works, but it has renal toxicity, and with heart failure patients, it's not a good strategy. So, so mon one of my main concerns about anatercin is the renal toxicity, but I'm aware of the thrombocytopenia and the deaths that occurred before they knew to look for it. Now that there's close scrutiny for thrombocytopenia, it's hopefully not going to be as much of a problem. Yes. Hey, uh, so my question was, in terms of the AOMS-1 knockout in mice, do they also have heart failure like the human counterparts? No, they don't. Uh, and so their heart, and then, as I mentioned, um, Jürgen Neger, who has focused his career and his life on, on Alstrom syndrome, didn't care about the hearts because those hearts did okay. We echoed them at uh, three months or four months, and their hearts are fine. And I think it has something to, and not everybody with Alstrom syndrome develops heart failure. So we may be missing a piece. I'm sure we're missing a piece. Um, as to what in, in this subset, uh, I showed you two patients in one family and four that we can prove for sure and another uh, of five that were analyzed in, in Toronto uh, that had um, heart failure, but, but it's not everybody who develops Alstrom syndrome that develops heart failure, and the mouse model doesn't develop heart failure. So there's something more, uh, but this proliferation effect is present in all of the mice that we've looked at. And the other question is, is the proliferation effect continuous from childhood to adulthood, or does it just yep. happen in the childhood period and stop? Yeah, good question, because I, I comfortably avoided that. Uh, when we look at later ages, at three months, for instance, those hearts look fine. There's no excess proliferation. But at 15 days, which was well past the seven-day point where we would expect to see all cardiomyocytes stop proliferation, by 15 days, there's still active proliferation. So it's a short period of extension. Uh, and what we're asking next is, can we can we stimulate that by, by injury? Does injury lead to increased proliferation? And so that, I don't have data yet to show on that. Well, thanks very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.